World War I began its bloody course over a hundred years ago, and its anniversary will be commemorated until 2018. In 1914, the newly developed airplane first had a role in reconnaissance. If enemy planes met, their pilots fired pistols at each other, but the need for fighter planes soon became apparent. In terms of reputation, the Fokker triplane, flown by the Red Baron himself, eclipsed all others. German ace Manfred von Richthofen once battled against Canadian ace Billy Bishop over France. Both survived that encounter. Welcome to Escapes with Nigel. I'm Nigel Napier-Andrews and today we're in Caledon where we're going to meet those frightfully keen, magnificent men in their flying machines. Inside a replica of what a wartime frontline flying hut might have looked like, they've created a museum with some marvelous displays to put their World War I planes in historical context. We're here to meet curator Natalie McAfee. This is such an interesting building, Natalie. What is the story behind the building? Well, it's a little like our airplanes. It's a replica, a very authentic looking replica of what would have been a forward station for an airfield um, during the First World War. So a sort of crew hut where they would sit and wait for the, for exactly. the call to go yes. flying. Yes, exactly. How did this whole Great War Flying Museum get started? It started in about the 1970s when three or four old Air Canada pilots wanted to fly interesting looking airplanes. And so they built them themselves and got it going from there. Now about this museum you've got here, what do you, what do, you do here and what, what goes on? Pretty well everything here has been donated either by members or by people who are heading to the dump to drop them off and we're the last resort. Um, so it's amazing what actually comes through the door. And what are some of the most interesting things you've got? We have some very interesting collections for Burt Wendt. Burt Wendt was an ace in the First World War. He had 36 victories. He went on to then be mayor of Toronto and became a journalist in one of the Toronto newspapers and became a journalist, a war journalist in the Second World War. And so his collection includes all his medals and um, all his discharge papers. And the completeness of those collections makes them personally very interesting. One of the other things I find very interesting are the things to do with Manfred von Richthofen. Um, the Red Baron is who we all know about as the First World War hero, and we have a signed photograph that was signed by him that was brought to us by one of his great nieces. And we also have one um, by his, of his sister. She was a nurse in the First World War. What an interesting bunch of things, and of course hundreds of other artifacts too, including some wonderfully detailed models of aeroplanes and bits of aeroplanes and uh, authentic uniforms. Now, do we know who those uniforms belong to that you have on display? Some of them, and some of them are unusual collections. We have one of Lieutenant Byrne, and his uniforms include the Royal Flying Corps, which was the earliest stage in the British Army, and then um, the Royal Air Force as it developed into, and then the Canadian Air Force, which only lasted for, for a few years. So we have all three of his uniforms and that's a rare combination. So we have quite a complete um, grouping of things for one or two people. You really get a feel for the whole person. This is such a fascinating place, this Great War Flying Museum. Can members of the public join it and become volunteers? Anyone can join it and be a volunteer. We tend to have some things that we desperately need volunteers for and some things that we already have terrific experts in. But like all small museums, we entirely depend on our volunteers. They make it work. What are your plans for the future? Well, they come in two stages. One is to reorganize the museum as it is here, um, to highlight some of our rarer artifacts, and also to put it together thematically so that it has a little more immediate meaning. And then the other is to expand to a wing that is a much more modern museum in which we can have more interactive things and also space to store all our aircraft so that you can see all of them at once. Now, I notice you've got really quite super airplane earrings. This would give me a hint that there's a possibility you're a pilot, are you in fact? I am indeed a pilot. I've been an aerobatic pilot for a great many years, um, entering contests. I basically, I fly tail dragger biplanes, which is what these airplanes are too. 
And you fly as much upside down as you do the right way up? Oh yes, it's not an airplane if you can't fly it upside down. <laughs> That's a great line. Okay, Natalie, thank you so much for sharing this great museum with me today. Thank you for being here. David Sargent is one of the dedicated team who keep the museum's World War I replica planes flying. So Dave, what are we doing here today? Uh, we're tightening up the, uh, some of the bracing wires. Mm -hmm. The pilot noticed on the last flight those was vibrating a bit. Uh, so we're just doing an adjustment on them, get a nice, uh, nice tone to them. And I guess in all of this, what we're doing here, safety is paramount. That's right, it's always first. Uh, departure. We want it to go as soon as it can, but it's got to be safe to go first. That's, right. the, uh, that's the main priority. It, uh, and the only priority, really, is it's safe to go. Uh, and we, wanna, we don't want to answer, answer any questions later, afterwards. Uh, right. Well, let's get on with yeah. fixing this. So we're going to, uh, now we have to lock these, uh, this turn barrel up once yeah, you've got it got in. Yeah, got them tuned properly. Yeah, you got the pliers, if you can pull that through, Nigel. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll pull that one. How far through? Uh, yeah, about halfway, so that right. looks good. And then we'll, that's about there. Yeah, you got to bend it. Bend each one. Up. Okay. Yeah, that's like that. Yeah, and then we'll get it bent. We'll keep that straight. And I'm going to feed that one. You can grab the bottom one. I'll feed the bottom one back through. Right. Down here. If you can, so if you can are... grab that one down at the bottom and pull that. Got it. Pulling it through. Yeah. Good. These old planes are. They're old, but they're still replicas. They're not the original first. World That's right. War yeah, they, these have a uh, even though they have a wooden wing, they yeah. uh, have a metal fuselage for uh, okay. easier maintenance. Uh, but the wing is uh, pretty true, except the covering. They would have had linen, whereas mm -hmm. say a synthetic dacron or a different type of covering. Originally, they would have had a, a linen covering on there, uh, which we don't use anymore. Mm -hmm. Any of the fabric aircraft. Uh, and you work on all the planes in the shop. Yeah, yeah, we are all. Uh, Driving, learning about all of them. Uh, it's a lot of relearning of things uh, we learned many years ago in school or as apprentices and right. uh, haven't done for a long time to get back into this. Uh, on these aircraft, even, even lock wiring takes a lot of practice. Uh, yes. Yeah, the same way. We're going to go the opposite way with this one. It's got to go back through that back side. Through there. Yeah, if you can grab that one. And, and of all these planes here, do you have a favorite, Dave? Well, this one, I, I, the Newport, I do like the look of the Newport. Yes. Yeah, if you can grab that one at the top there, too, okay, we'll pull that. Okay, I've got you. The, uh, I don't know. It's like knitting, isn't it? It is, yeah. And then we're going to, we're going to nice and tight, and we're going to, we're going to wrap it all around there, do a double, a spiral wrap, it's called, on it, to, uh, but anyway, the Newport, I always think, looks, it looks like it's f the fastest, even when it's sitting still, the, uh, this one, it just yeah. has a nice look to it, and, uh, all right. And then, now what about the the uh, Fokker triplane? How about that as a as a plane? Do you like that plane? I do. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that's the classic look that we all recognize, even from when you're kids. You start right. seeing that's the first one we see, the Red Baron, and uh, right. it's uh, instantly recognizable to everybody. It's funny we do get kids out here at the end of the school yes. year, quite a few, and most of them that's the one thing they recognize. Anything right. else you ask them who you, who flies that, the Red Baron, they all. Uh, the all know the Red Baron there. Well, I think it's really nice in this time of peace that we have Canadian Air Force planes, we have American planes, and we have German planes all peacefully coexisting That's in right, the same yeah. hangar. That's <laughs> right, Who would have thought that? Uh, I mean, flying these all these years ago, we would have been ago. doing this. Uh, That's right. We would still have them here. Uh. Well, Dave, this looks like you're doing a really fantastic job, and I have every, every confidence that this <laughs> wing strut is going to stay on when we go flying, so I'm going to leave you to finish this okay. off. Thank you for lending me your needle nose pliers. You're welcome. Thanks for your help, Nigel. Okay, great. Bye-bye. John Weatherseed has had to master some forgotten skills to rebuild these antique planes by authentic methods. John, this is the most amazing piece of woodwork I've ever seen. How much of this did you personally build? Well, I was personally involved in the structure called the spars, which are these two parallel beams that extend the length of the wing. And, and other colleagues have built all the other pieces? Exactly. We had one individual who built the ribs, which defined the airfoil shape of it and another uh, trained cabinet maker who's a volunteer member of the museum who actually assembled all these bits together to create the wing. 
And what are these wires inside the wing for? Well, the wing, the wires inside are bracing wires that do what they say. They actually hold the whole structure together so it doesn't change shape. And in the olden days, would it have been built exactly like this? It, almost identically. Some of the materials that we use for finishing, as in the shiny surface that you see, are different. We use new formulations and epoxies opposed to the glues that they would have used back in 1918. But the actual shape and the structure, the pieces of wood that are used are identical. And is this a this is part of a biplane, I presume? That is correct. This right. is the lower wing for a Fokker D7 fighter aircraft from 1918. Goodness me, it's an, it's an extraordinary piece of engineering. And when these things went up during the World War I, how long would an airplane last typically? Well, for the pilot, you'd want to be optimistic and assume it would last until the end of the war. Right. Um, in reality, they were designed for a few months duration until the next better aircraft came along. This was the ultimate iteration of technology in the world in World War I was aircraft. They developed extremely rapidly over the five years of the war. Now I noticed that there's no moving parts on this, so how did they fly it? How did they steer it? And, and... Well this wing, the purpose of this wing, which is the lower wing of the D7 airplane, was purely for lift. So the actual aerodynamic surfaces that control flight are on the upper wing. What we're going to be covering it with is a modern reproduction of the original pre-printed fabric that covered the airplane. It's commonly referred to as lozenge fabric because of the shape of the pattern in it. And this was something defined by the German military to create a uniform standard for the covering of aircraft. And the intention was from thousands of feet away these colors would blend together and hide you against the landscape. So we're going to stretch this over this surface and, and, and are you going to use the same authentic sort of um, materials they used in those to days to stretch it? To considerable degrees. Um, what happens is that the fabric itself actually sh defines the shape of the wing. Everything else underneath is just there to allow the wing to exist. Mm -hmm. So the ribs define the shape. The main structural pieces, the spars, hold the ribs into position, the wire bracing contributes towards that, but it's the shape of the envelope or the fabric over it that gives it the aerodynamic properties that allows the airplane to fly. I notice there's a little sort of nubbly here, so presumably a strut goes in there and it goes up here and then there's another wing on top of it. You're correct, there's actually a strut. Mm -hmm. um, these two sockets to two similar sockets mm -hmm. on the upper wing of the biplane. And that wing is up here somewhere. That is correct. Right. It's, it's actually almost five feet above. Five feet. And what they do is that they prevent twisting mm -hmm. of the wing um, at the outboard ends and allow the wings to stay in um, constant sort of position to each other and not changing the aerodynamics between the wings. A bit of an art that doesn't exist anymore since not a imagine. lot of people are designing biplanes. You must devote hours and hours and hours to volunteer work in this museum. Well, it's one of the tricks of working on aircraft like this is that you're using skills that aren't commonly practiced nowadays. And a lot of the time, a lot of the volunteer work is trying to gain the skills to be able to do the work to the standards required for an airworthy airplane. In reality, to build this one wing is probably a thousand hours total. Gosh. Just for the one wing. To build an airplane like one of these back here, starting from drawings and raw materials, would be four to five thousand hours. Do you have fun doing all this? Oh, absolutely. If you didn't have fun, you wouldn't be doing it. Right. And what's the most fun you've had with these airplanes? Um, the most fun is actually working on something, completing it, and seeing the aircraft fly. Until it flies, it's not really a finished project. A lot of us in the museum don't want to cover this wing because it looks so nice the way it is. Mm. But until the fabric's on, it's on the airplane, and the airplane's in the air, it's not really a completed project and you don't have all the satisfaction you could. Former commercial pilot Jerry Fotheringham is one of the Flying Museum's top aces. Good morning, Jerry. Morning. How are you? Good, nice to meet you. Nice to see you. How long have you been a pilot? <sighs> well, 60 some years, I guess. Now, have you flown every plane that's in the museum? I've flown all of these. I've got uh, 
50 different tailwheel types. My goodness, yeah. that's, a, that's a lot of flying. Yeah. Now, you've obviously been, uh, in your long and eminent career, a uh, commercial pilot. Yes. So, is, are these planes harder to fly than a great big commercial jet? Well, uh, like apples and oranges, they're very different. It's a big commercial airplane is easy to fly if you've got the background and the training. These, uh, you've got to be on your toes all the time. You fly them. So this is seat of the pants flying? That's real seat of the pants flying. Yeah. Is that where the expression came from? Yeah, probably, yeah, because uh, that's where all the motion is there. Right, that's where you feel it. Before instruments and things. Yeah. That's right, because you have all instruments in these for safety reasons, but yeah. I guess in the old days they didn't have uh, any of that. They had two or three, that's all. Right. Engine revolution and altitude and right. speed, that's about it. Right. Yeah. Well, there's a bunch of planes here. Shall we go and look at some yes. more? Go ahead, we'll go around this way. <clears throat> So what do we got here, Jerry? Well, here we have the famous Fokker DR-1. This is the aircraft that was uh, flown by the Baron von Richthofen. The famous Red Baron. The famous Red Baron, and his markings and his aircraft. And I notice it's got three wings, so that would be quite different from the planes we've seen so far. Yeah, they put three wings on to cut down the wingspan to make it more agile, a faster turning airplane. Mm -hmm. And does it make it uh, an interesting plane to fly? Oh, it is very interesting. It's a skittish little beast. Is it now? It is indeed. Now, I notice all these planes have got machine guns on them. Do those work? Yeah, well, these, these are replicas, but uh, they wouldn't allow the real ones. What, you mean we can't go up and have a dogfight up there and actually shoot real bullets at each other? Not real bullets, but no. you can have a good dogfight, though. Okay. Which is your favorite plane in the whole museum? My favorite one is over here, but to get to it, we've got to go this way. Okay, let's do that. It's a French-built Newport 28, uh -huh. and uh, it was given to the Americans when they entered the war because the Americans didn't have any airplanes of their own, and it wasn't really a successful fighter, but uh, I like it personally. Do you? Yeah. Well, I can see it must be quite difficult taking off. I mean, you can't well, even see where you're going. It's a fast airplane. It's much faster than the others, but it's blind as a bat on takeoff and landing, as you can see. And that's that was its main drawback. But the French just really wanted to get rid of them. Did well, they? they didn't like them. They they had the Spad coming along, and this airplane needs to shed its top wings in the dive, which is a bad feature if they got going fast. You mean literally the yeah. wings would fall the, off? Well, the glue, the glue would come apart, and the fabric would go, and that was it. And that would be it. You'd yeah. be straight into the ground, That's I guess. Right. Well, gosh, they even have it built into a video game, so it was well okay. known for doing that. Right. Yeah. Well, I've fully paid up member of the museum, I've paid my dues, I've been elected to membership by the board, I'm thrilled to be part of the organization, so now I can go flying, and are you going to be my pilot today? Afraid not, uh, we have to get somebody else for that privilege, but uh, I'll have to go and find them. Oh, well, let's All right, do let's that now. do that, right. Pilot Mike Smith handles the planes with the consummate ease of a seasoned professional. Hi, Mike. Hello. Great to see you today. Nice to see you. So I understand you're going to be my pilot for today's flight. I am, yes. Fantastic. What sort of plane is this? This is a Sopwith one and a half strutter. Okay, what does that mean? Made by the uh, Sopwith company in England during the war. And the one and a half strutter refers to the configuration of the uh, interplane struts between the wings. Right. You can see this one has a full set of struts. So that's one? That's one. And that's a half. the half one's there. Got so it. Called one and a half strutter. Okay. And this is the plane that members of the public, or, or rather people who paid to become members of the museum, can go up in. Yeah. Well, let's go and see where I'm going to sit. Okay. So this is your seat here. This is where the gunner would have sat. Okay. Hence the machine gun here. Right. And does it work? No. Curse you, Red Baron. Well, it's just an amazing plane. It seems awfully small. Actually, this was quite big for a World War I airplane. Really? Yeah. Well. I guess, uh, I guess the whole journey is going to be in the lap of the gods. I know you have to go and do some safety checks, so uh, let's get ready. Okay, well, here we go. Oh, that's nice and comfy. Testing, one, two, check, check. That's very good. And the machine gun's ready, and so am I.
that was the most spectacular experience. I think the really great thing about it was just flying low enough to you still had contact with the ground and you could see all the little houses and the people and the cows in the fields and the cars on the streets and everything. It was just spectacularly interesting and good. And it wasn't bumpy at all really. It was no worse than being on a sailboat on a rough day, but it was great, great fun. Thank you for joining me today in Caledon, Ontario at the Great War Flying Museum. For more information, check out their website and please don't forget to visit my website for all sorts of extras about the show. We'll see you next time on Escapes with Nigel. Thank you.